Hello, I'm Andrew Gentile. And I'm Ariana. And you're listening to Behind the Flicks. This show is all about me sharing as many facts as I know about filmmaking and directors and behind the scenes info about movies and whatnot to Ariana. You'll join us for the ride. Listeners, we have a treat for you. Our guest was actually involved in the creation of the movies we'll be covering over the course of the next two episodes. In this episode, part one, we'll be discussing The Other Side of the Wind. Ariana, can we get a review of The Other Side of the Wind? Yeah, uh, man, The Other Side of the Wind. You know, the first time I watched this, I, uh, I, I, my, my review was, was not good. It was really hard to follow. And I probably watched it a little too late at night, and it was hard to focus on, and I didn't really understand what was going on. However, I have now watched this movie three times, and my opinion of it has completely shifted. <laughs> and this is an extremely, I think, intriguing movie. And I, um, a comment that you and I had, you know, outside of this podcast was you mentioned that it was quite radical, the way that it was filmed. And, um... When I first watched it, I, I didn't feel that. I felt like it was messy. But after re-watching it a couple of times, I realized how purposeful it was and how really, really well done he did it. And um, it's definitely massively radical, especially considering it was filmed in the 70s. And so, um, altogether, I mean, the performances in this movie are A+. And uh, the relationships that he shows are so subtle and um but clear at the same time so the writing is really great and it's of course directed just really really cool i mean i wouldn't the editing style is just so it it's chaotic but very purposeful at the same time and so it's um after you watch it a time or two it's like very intriguing to try to figure out what he was trying to say and do throughout the movie um so i would i would actually up this one i i my first uh perception of this was like a C because it was I didn't get it but now that I get it more yeah, I get easy A really yeah I really think it's cool I, I, now that I've seen it a couple times I'm like low key uh, obsessed with this movie I plan on watching it more throughout my life no kidding <laughs> yeah that's so cool yeah um, it's good uh, just, for, just for the listeners we recorded this uh, before this introduction before and uh and Ariana actually said, "Hey, can we do that again? I've watched the movie more." And in her first, in her first review, her initial review, she gave it a C, but now she's upping it to an to an A. And this is this is not my bias coming off on you, right? No, no, okay, not good. at all. Okay, good. Um, I mean, I but love. I want. I won't lie though, because it is Orson Welles, and I didn't. I mean, I we all kind of know who he is, but not really. Sure. Uh, the more I've learned about Orson Welles and the more I've learned about, you know, the <laughs> radical nature of his filmmaking, like seeing something like this and understanding him more makes me love the movie more. So I think it's fun to learn about the creators. It helps you appreciate the content more. I totally agree. And, um, you know, something that uh, I don't think, what well, you know, just, just to be clear to the listeners, when I say radical... You know, usually when when Ariana and I say radical, you know, usually when people think of like Citizen Kane, they don't think of radical because it's the because what Citizen Kane does is the norm. But guess who made the norm? Orson Welles, you know. Yeah. And then you know, and then you know, jump forward, uh, gosh, how many years? Thir- over thirty years later to F or Fake, um, when he's trying out all these crazy editing things. You know, you look at F for fake and you see how radical the editing was then. And only recently have people caught up to it. People are still catching up to the other side of the wind, you know? Yeah. Uh, e- even from 28, e- even starting in 2018. Yeah. I mean, it is, like I said, when you first watch it, it feels like chaotic and like, yeah. what the heck is happening? Um, but the more that you watch it, you just realize that the style, like, it is very documentary-esque. Um, but it's so much more than that right. because of the story that he created. So that's why it's so cool. Like, you go to the movie theater, you don't really see movies do that very often. I mean, not in the consistent way that this film does. Right. Right. Exactly. So it still feels new. And then, can you believe it was 
filmed in the 70s and it feels new <laughs> in 2020. I mean, I, I mean, there are a lot of movies like that, but n- not like there are. But I mean, there are a lot of movies that feel new uh, that were fi- that were filmed like half a century ago. This is its own thing. You know, this feels like this is this feels like it's from the future. Yeah, that's how I describe it. It, it doesn't feel like it's new. It feels like it's not even of this planet yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just so, so well done. And I, the way that it's written too is just so subtle, which I, I love. Like, I feel like uh, a lot of movies now are kind of direct with the way that they want you to see and tell the story. I mean, for people like me that need something to be easily absorbed in order to understand it, you know, um, but he didn't do that. He just kind of tells the story in the best way he can while being as authentic as possible, which is why it feels so much like a documentary, I think. Right. Uh, absolutely. I think the performances are amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, incredible. I I mean, I'm with you. I think you, you liked uh, um, Brooksy's character the most, right? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. Uh uh, Peter, B- uh, sorry, l- let me know if I'm pointing the, pointing the right direction. Uh, P- Peter Bogdanovich, the, the guy right there. There you go. Perfect. All right, cool. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I met Peter Bogdanovich, um, actually for like 30 seconds. Um, I was at the Roxy theater in San Francisco for his 80th birthday celebration. And they were start- showing a double feature of the last picture show and St. Jack. And, uh, Peter Bogdanovich was in attendance just for the record, uh, when he appeared from behind, pr- appeared for the first section of the Q&A, I was the first one who stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Then everybody else followed. Just for the record. I was the first <laughs> just one. Just for the record. <laughs> yeah, I was the first one to give him the standing ovation. After the Q&A, uh, after the last picture show, I, I timidly went up to him and I said, Hi, I'm Andrew. You, you, know, you know, this was like two years ago. <laughs> Uh, 2019, yeah. I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure that you still uh, um, post-puberty there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Andrew! You, you know, because I was all nervous-like. Yeah. And um, and he said, okay. And, you know, I was like, oh, sh- oh I'm screwing this up as, I, as I'm talking. And so, and then I said, I just want to let you know, I, I'm in the middle of taking a class on Orson Welles taught by Joe McBride, who's going to be our guest today. Yeah. And he said, oh, I know Joe. Very nice man. Aww. And so uh, the point the point of the story being the one thing I really regret from that interaction is I didn't tell him I loved his performance in The Other Side of the Wind. I should have said that. I was just so nervous. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a, I mean, somebody that you, I mean, I'm sure you know his work. I mean, like, had you met somebody uh, of his caliber before? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Oh wow! Yeah, I, that's a good one too. I was at the Castro Theater. My for my birthday present, my mom had gotten me a uh, tick a ticket because they were so expensive. A ticket by myself to see uh, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, like at the premiere of his book, The Godfather Notebook, uh, which is basically a document on how he wrote The Godfather, uh, for, adapted The Godfather. And, you know, I got, like, a signed copy of the book and stuff like that. Oh, and nice. and originally they were not they were just going to take questions from, like, a slip of paper, slips of paper that audiences wrote on and then had submitted. And Adam Savage of the Mythbusters was the moderator. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. And so, um, but then Francis Ford Coppola said, and stopped, he stopped the, uh, Francis Ford Coppola stopped the uh, show and he said, hang on, I want to see the audience. Raise the lights, raise the lights, raise the lights. And then I was one of, uh, and then he said, I want to take questions from the audience. Hmm. And so, and I was, and there were two people who asked questions. I was the last person. Oh, wow. And I was like shaking, you know, I was like 17 at the time. And I said, yeah. hi, Mr. Coppola. Thank you so much. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So, did you get to ask Peter Bogdanovich a question during the Q and A? Not, I, I, I couldn't think of anything during the. Q- well, first of all, uh, I, I don't think they took questions from the audience. They just oh, had, okay. had an interviewer. So, but by my my point is, I really regret not telling him. Yeah. 
I, 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 well, sh- I should have said I loved your performance in The Other Side of the Wind. I, I think it should have been nominated for like an Oscar. Something. Yeah, something. I mean, because it's hard. It could, I mean, has there ever been a Netflix movie that's been nominated for Oscars? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, but The Irishman. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. Gosh yeah. darn. I mean, why not like put them up for an Oscar even if it was filmed 30 years ago? Who cares? Yeah. 40 years I, ago, 50 years ago. I, I mean, it's a nearly it, it was a nearly released movie. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's too late now, huh? Yeah, too late now. Awards, am I right? Who yeah. who who needs them? <laughs> I I don't need an award for validation. All right. Yeah, but back to the other side of the wind. Right. I I I guess what uh, really amazes me about this movie is that. Um, it's very radical. Yeah, like we, we talked about this already, but pe- pe- like people don't give, I really think I need to emphasize, people don't give Wells enough credit for being radical. Yeah. He was constantly experimenting with camera and performance and angles and lighting and uh, set design and all these different things and sound. I mean, he, he, he I, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And he's genuinely one of my favorite filmmakers ever, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I gotta love him. Yeah. He's a great actor too. He he is a fantastic actor. Yeah, you're right. So, and have you seen Citizen Kane? Yeah, I, I would watch it in a film class. Oh, what did you think of his performance in that? Oh, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I couldn't. I mean, I don't. You don't really see actors portray themselves through age in a single film very right. often. Right. And so I thought that was really cool because he played every age that he was in that in that film, and it, it takes course over how many years? Like since he was eight until like like I tell his character was eight up until he dies or past yeah. when he dies, you know. Yeah, so he's probably at least in his like sixties or so in the film. Probably somewhere. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, I need to rewatch it again. Any final thoughts? Uh, no. No, I'm excited to talk to the professor. So, at this point in the podcast, I would usually start by giving the facts and the history behind the film. Uh, but there's a reason I won't be doing that. Joseph McBride was involved in The Other Side of the Wind since his first day of filming. He knows the creation of that film probably better than anyone else. Instead, I'll introduce our guest. He was a screenwriter, having written the American Film Institute Lifetime Achievement Award tribute specials for such legends as James Stewart, Frank Capra, and Fred Astaire. His work co-writing the special in honor of John Huston won him a Writers Guild of America Award. He is a film critic, having been published in Variety and Film Quarterly. He is the author of fantastic books, uh, including, but certainly not limited to, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, A Portrait of an Independent Career, Writing a Picture, Screenwriting Made, Mostly Painless, and his memoir, The Broken Places. His upcoming books are Billy Wilder, Dancing on the Edge, coming in October of this year, as well as an updated edition of Whatever Happened to Orson Welles. Look out for that in 2022. You can pre-order the former on Columbia University Press's website and the latter on Amazon. And now let's go to our interview with Joseph McBride. So we'll just jump into the questions. Good. Uh, I, so f- I, I did just want to say really quick, thank you for doing this. I'm really excited that you're here oh. and I get to meet you. And I've never met anybody that's really been involved in the business before, heavily huh. anyways, to your caliber. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Oh, thank you so much. That's really nice of you. And Andrew is uh, one of my favorite students. He's been really helpful to me with, uh, he probably told you, he helped, he helped guide me through how to do online classes, which I'm very grateful for. Oh. Yes, he, he did mention that he was helping out. As, as, as well as being a great student in every way. So uh, I'm <laughs> in your debt. But what, what, are you a film student or what do you what do? you do? Uh, no, no. I've taken little bits of film classes, you know. Oh. Really, it's just a, an earnest loving of movies. That What's I'm your, doing. do you have a job uh, besides this or what are you doing? Yeah, I'm a waitress. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a tough job in today's world, huh? <laughs> Oh man, it's tiring, but it's fun. <laughs> yeah, I hope you're safe. You, you, uh, keep keep safe with the mask or the whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, they're very careful with us, which is good. I'm glad that I still get to see people, but be careful at the same time. That's good. What's your? Do you have a career goal in films or broadcasting or anything like that? Um, not necessarily. I think my my pipe dream is to be an actress. I've been talking with with Andrew about that recently. Oh, um, she's very and, talented. Oh, oh thank you. Great, great. <laughs> 
Well, Andrew can direct you in a film then and get oh you going. Oh my gosh, he yeah. has twice already. <laughs> oh, okay. I've, I, we're ahead of the game. I'm glad to know this because I like to know, you know, who I'm talking to and what your interests are. And yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a layman when it comes to, um, I, like, I'm easily entertained. I'm kind of a crunchy leaf kind of person when it comes to film. So I've had a lot of, like, just useless fun intake. Um, but I love learning about the artistic stuff too and luckily i have andrew who's taught me a lot and shown me a lot of really wonderful movies. great wonderful thank you thank yeah. you billy wilder uh dancing on the edge yeah it's coming out this fall from columbia university press and i just finished recording the audio commentary for billy wilder's film the emperor waltz and i did the fortune cookie billy wilder they're both coming out in august also i i should say i'm updating this third wells book whatever happened to orson wells uh, that's that's like really part of the you know what we're talking about today so um yes first of all thank you so much as ariana said earlier for joining us i really appreciate it and uh i think this is gonna be a lot of fun um so as we were talking about uh please tell us more about your upcoming books uh billy wilder dancing on the edge and an updated version of whatever happened to orson wells yeah, the Wells uh, book um, came out in 2006. That was a big job to uh, compress his entire life and career into uh, 400 pages. It could, you know, the trouble with Wells is he's such a huge subject, you could go on for thousands of pages and, and many years, as Simon Callow is doing. I don't write biographies of Wells uh, partly for that reason, but this is, a, it was an unusual. Uh, form of a book. It's a critical study slash memoir because I knew and worked with him in his last 15 years. And so I had this unusual perspective of being critic and observer as well. Uh, it's, so it, I've updated the book to come out early next year from University Press of Kentucky. And um, I, I've added a new chapter on the other side of the wind because it's been completed and released. And also the rediscovery uh, or discovery of his early film, Too Much Johnson, which was totally unexpected and really a treat to have a pre-Citizen Kane work of Orson Welles, another one come out. I, I had helped um, discover his early film, The Hearts of Age, which he made in 1934. My film professor in Madison, Russell Merritt, tipped me that it exists and uh, it existed in Connecticut. So I went there and wrote about it. And Welles was not happy that I had discovered an early film because he wanted people to think he just burst on the scene with no background with Citizen Kane. But he also did uh, this elaborate Too Much Johnson, which is a feature length uh, work, although it's never it's not completed, but you can watch it online. And it's uh, it, it was supposed to be parts of a uh, stage show that never they never managed to get the show to New York. They did it out of town. They couldn't use the film clips. It's a long story, but the film film material survived anyway that's the story on that one and the billy wilder book is uh has been long in the works uh, about 11 years i've been doing other books in the meantime as, as you know but i started uh, at the same time i did my, started my ernst lubitsch book how did lubitsch do it and i did some work on wilder then and i decided I was going to do Wilder and Lubitsch together and because they're similar and Wilder was Lubitsch's protege but I realized they're quite different and also they're both they both have big bodies of work and um, I needed a whole book for Billy Wilder and uh, so I've been uh, working on this it's a, it's a critical study and he worked a lot in Europe and, and, and then in the United States and uh, his work in Europe hasn't been covered very thoroughly. And so a lot of my effort went into that. It was fascinating. His work as a journalist and as a screenwriter, and then he directed a film in France and then came to America. Even his early Hollywood work as a screenwriter has been neglected because he didn't direct the films, but they're very interesting in terms of his development. So that was a big project and I'm, I'm really happy with it. And just for uh, listeners who Sadly, may not be familiar with Billy Wilder. Um, could, could you maybe say a couple of his most quote unquote f popular films? Yeah, that's that's always a good thing to do. Thank you for. I'm just getting started talking about this oh, book. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, so that's a, a good thing to remember. Tell them. Uh, well, he was um, American cinema's uh, most um, kind of provocative satirist for, for many years, and um, 
he helped kind of break a lot of taboos and barriers and his most famous films that people would know and maybe have seen it was some like it hot which is a great great film maybe the funniest american sound film and um also seems very far ahead of its time in terms of gender issues today and uh, the apartment is a great film that he won three oscars for writing directing and producing co-writing with iel diamond um he um he also made a lot of dramas uh double indemnity is a great classic film noir and he made uh, the lost weekend and sunset boulevard is one of my favorites and uh, anybody who sees that I think we'll love that film. It's a great film about Hollywood. So he's, he's, he has a rich and varied career. And so it's been fun writing, but I, I try to pick projects now that are fun because what's the point otherwise, you know, exactly. <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, unless you had any more question, uh, information that you can provide the audience about those books, um, how did you become interested in, such films, you know, because you're clearly such a wonderful writer. Um, you could have, I mean, expressed it uh, in any. Yes, of course. Uh, by the way, I should mention before anything else, I've read a number of your books and I can absolutely, you know, say, please, re please go out, buy any of his books. They're wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the okay. broken, including your memoir, The Broken Places, uh, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles. I read the previous version. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to hear because you're always one of my best students and uh, really a great contributor to my classes and Andrew taught me a lot you know that's one thing I learned when you be, I became a teacher is your students teach you things so I learned a lot from Andrew so thank you oh, no. oh thank you um, I, I mean that that really means so much to me uh, coming from such a such an incredibly talented and generous man thank you um, so there's any av number of avenues you could have expressed uh, in writing um, a number of uh, ways you could have expressed uh, your passions. Why film? Why? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, and, and hi to Ariana. Great to be with you on, on this broadcast. Too. Oh, uh, yeah, great to see you. Uh, I, I was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1965. That's when I arrived there. And I was, I always was a film fan when I was a kid. I would go to see weekend movies a lot and I would watch a Western every day on television at four o'clock. We had a Western show and, and, uh, but when I got, uh, into high school, I, I didn't watch movies much because I was just working my tail off, um, in high school. And, and if you read the broken places, you'll know that didn't, didn't work out too well. <laughs> uh, but I, I got a good education, but it was, you know, I, I it would have been good for me to go to see more movies. So, but I, I, I was a bit <laughs> spotty on films in the sixties, but I got to Madison and I was planning to be a journalist and novelist. Um, and I had been a journalist since 1960. I sold my first article in 1960. And so I've been at this for, what, 61 years. Um, but when I, I went to a film class in 1966, in September 22nd, I remember the date because it was so important. I tell my students, you can walk in a film class, it could change your life today. And that's what happened to me. I saw Citizen Kane for the first time in Richard Burns introductory film class and back then we only had three film classes you know it was uh, the film studies thing had not really taken off there were a few schools around the country that had film courses over the years but we just had three and they were usually in the english department and um, i quickly exhausted those three courses which were pretty basic although i, I got to see a lot of good films and I, I had a madison was a great place to see films because um I, I made a deal with the university. They were very nice that they had an audio visual center and all the films rented for every class would come into this place. There was 16 millimeter in those days. And, you know, we didn't have um, DVDs and things that we could watch at home. And so you had to, you know, rent a 16 millimeter print. And I didn't have any money. And so I ran the campus film society so I could bring in whatever I wanted to see as long as I made a profit. So I would show like Fellini and Bergman movies to make a profit. So I had some extra money to bring in John Ford and Billy Wilder movies. I remember I did a, a double bill of uh, uh, Billy Wilder's Ace in the Hole, which is a really despairing, bleak film with John Ford's Wagon Master, which is one of the most optimistic films about American life. I, I like to kind of be outrageous 
and do things like that. And you I did that. You people on a ride with that one. <laughs> yeah, it's a particular roller coaster ride. I like to shake people up. Um, I remember one time we showed Freaks, a great MGM film that is really freaky. And Tom Browning. Yeah, yeah, it's a terrific film, but it, it, it is disturbing. But we showed it with, um, oh, um, what was it? Oh, The Blood of the Beasts, which is a George Fanju film. He's a great French filmmaker, but it's about the slaughterhouses of France. And it starts with um, people eating in a nice restaurant in Paris, eating steaks and stuff. And the narrator says, while you're eating your wonderful food, do you ever think where this food comes from? And then it dissolves to a slaughterhouse and they're ripping up animals and stuff. And I showed that. And, and it turned out that a friend of mine said, could I bring my new girlfriend to the film? And I said, sure. And so she showed up and she was this very nice woman from India who had just arrived in America, you know. And I had to warn her about the program. And I said, you know, because in India, I guess they revere cows. And I said, this is going to maybe be pretty disturbing for you. And she handled it well. But this is the first film she saw in America where they're ripping up animals and stuff. And, and I, I said, were you OK? And she said, yeah, I'm OK. So she was pretty cool, you know. But anyway, so I did that. And then it was an impeccable memory. <laughs> yeah, I remember these moments. Uh, I was a showman. I tried to be a showman, you know. And that's what you do in a class, too. I like to bring my enthusiasms and discoveries to the students and, and get them kind of open their minds to new things. And so with the audio visual center all day long, I was there from nine to five and I would see films that were shown in say history classes, you know, like Triumph of the Will or Potemkin or uh, all different kinds of stuff. And uh, it was just a gold mine of wonderful material. And then at night we had 35 film societies on campus, which shows you how cinephilia was back then. It was just great. So I would pick, pick you know among those films and and i also helped run the uh, student union film facility where we showed 35 millimeter films and we had uh, it was different in those days people were so passionate about films we had screaming matches and we even had fist fights over what films to bring sometimes there were some <laughs> memorable fist fights in there and uh <laughs> I could tell you stories about it. But anyway, so so uh, I, like I went the to the passion. The passion was the passion. It was the film. We called it the art form of the 20th century. And unfortunately, that's what it was. The art form of the 20th century It's not necessarily the art form of the 21st century. But we could talk a bit about that. But anyway, a big moment for me was when I discovered Orson Welles. I just uh, totally flipped over Citizen Kane because uh, for a lot of reasons, um, uh, it, it's a film that Kane is kind of uh, shows a young man's love for the medium you know he, he was he tried all kinds of things people had done them before i was on a podcast the other day about the 80th anniversary of kane the guy kept saying well didn't he innovate this and innovate that well he didn't he didn't do things for the first time necessarily except for the sound he brought a lot of sound expertise to film in, in an advanced way because he had been a radio uh uh genius and a theater man too but in terms of cinema a lot of the things had been done before but he did them in a more flamboyant way and and he just did so many things and it's full of uh visual effects and uh, things but the story is audacious too i was really impressed that a young man would take on william randolph hearst as the kind of prototype for kane you know that became controversial that you would take on this media tycoon and it's about the media too which is always interested me as a subject and um the idea that a 24 year old person could make this film just knocked me out because hollywood in those days even in the late 60s was still mostly old guys you know very few women i mean there were women working as screenwriters and you know and behind the scenes on various things but uh, a lot of it was this sort of old boy network and you had to be the son of a cameraman to get a job and stuff and here's this 24 year old guy just breaking in and just uh, getting this great contract where he could do whatever he wanted pretty much and and um he's from wisconsin which really made me feel connected to him and so all these things i just thought okay i'm going to write about films and make films i thought i'd be a screenwriter director and i wanted to make a film by the time i was 25 like wells had and uh, that didn't happen, although I started writing screenplays on my own and we didn't have a screenwriting class. Uh, so I taught myself how to write screenplays. And one way I did that was um, at the Wisconsin Historical Society, which is a great archive on campus. They had a small collection of Wells papers from his lawyer and they had the script of Kane. 
And back then, you know, scripts were not being published. So I found the script of Cain, which is my favorite script ever. Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles wrote this amazing multi-layered script with fabulous dialogue and great technique and, and powerful themes. And so I, I spent a month typing an exact copy of that script with my little portable typewriter because I couldn't afford to Xerox stuff. I was working as a dishwasher and make, making $10 a week and, and hot meals, you know, that's about it. And so I was typing the script, which is a really a good exercise I'd recommend because you really kind of internalize the, the script and I, I took it home with me and I studied it. David Mamet did that with uh, Tennessee Williams Streetcar Named Desire. And you can certainly buy that or get that from a library, but he, he typed a copy and he said that helped him learn about playwriting. And so I had the script of Kane, and then somehow, I don't know how I did this, I can't recall, I borrowed a 16 millimeter print from somebody. And so I watched the film over and over. I, I think I saw it 60 times in the next four years. And I, I've got it to the point, now it's over 100 and I've lost track. And I have a hard, hard time watching it because I have it sort of memorized. I know exactly what the next shot is and the next line of dialogue. And it, you know, you kind of wear things out a little. Um, but I, I, that was my textbook. So I was teaching myself how to how to write films. And I started smartly with uh, writing short films because I didn't feel up to writing a feature. And then I graduated into, I started writing feature length things and um, most were not very good, but the short films were fun to do. And I directed a few of those. Uh, back then you had to, had to spend actual money on um, film stock, which was hard because I'd have to save up for like six months to get $400 to make a film. And um, now you can, if you can, if you have a camera uh, you, or a friend has a camera, you can shoot a film for nothing. So I, I directed six of these things silent, which is good training too, because I didn't have sound. And so Kane ch changed my life. And so I started writing a book on Kane. And I went, to, actually, what happened was I went to the library and I thought, okay, I'd like to read about Orson Welles. And there wasn't a good book on him. Um, there was, one critical study I didn't think was very good. And Peter Bogdanovich had done a short book on him, which I couldn't find at the time. And that was about it. And um, so I, I thought, well, I'll write my own. And I, I thought I'd write a whole book about this one film. And I spent two years just doing that. And then I thought I began right at the time I, I saw Kane, they had a series of Wells films that our student union just by chance, they showed 16 millimeter prints in the beer the beer garden kind of area. And so I got to see the Magnificent Ambersons and Touch of Evil and other films that I thought, wow, uh, Ambersons, I think is my favorite film of all time. And I thought, well, he did so much more. It's not just Kane. And then I began thinking his whole career should be analyzed. And there was a terrific series called Cinema One Books from the British Film Institute. And back then it was relatively easy to get a film book published because uh, it was a new field. and. It was open to What's anybody. A film book? Well, book, books about a director, books oh. about, uh, you know, a genre, any, any book about film. You know, there weren't too many serious books about films until the 60s. There were a few here and there. But th then there was this explosion of interest in reading about films. And so the Cinema One series, they did mostly books on directors, famous directors. And, and so, you know, I thought, uh, Wells would be a perfect subject for that. I started, this is a good piece of advice I'd give anybody listening. The way I sold this book was um, I started publishing chapters of it in film magazines like Film Quarterly and Film Heritage and Sight and Sound. And it was a way of making my name known because when you're young, I was only 19, you have to kind of make a name for yourself. Today, you know, I'd be doing a podcast. I mean, if if there were podcasts, then I would have done one. It's a great way to get your name around. But, you know, write for film journals and stuff. And so people knew my name. And then when I finished this book in 1970, I wrote to the editor of uh, Sight and Sound, who was the editor of the Cinema One series, Penelope Houston. And I said, I finished my book on Wells. Would you like to consider? And she wrote back and said, you know, I could almost guarantee you I'll publish this book because I've read a lot of it. But <laughs> yeah, send it along. And within another week or so, she wrote back and said, we'll publish it. So that that worked like a charm, you know? Yeah. And so they published this book in 1972. And then I, I launched into one on John Ford with my friend, Michael Wilmington. I thought I needed a collaborator because Ford was such a big subject. And Mike was a very smart, is a very smart guy. Uh, he's an actor too. He taught me a lot about acting. And so we had spirited uh, discussions on Ford and that really helped. And 
and that took about two years to write that book. And then it took a long time to get it published because Ford was out of fashion in the US, but the cinema, Cinema One had a companion series called Cinema Two, and they published it in 1974. But you know, but it took um, oh what three years after we turned it in for them to publish it. It was very frustrating. And Ford died in the interim, and I, I wanted him to read it, and he didn't. And um, I actually had to fly to London at one point and walk in unannounced to the office and demand that they publish the book or give it back to me. And they, their excuse was, we can't find an American publisher. This shows you how little interest there was in Ford at the time, our greatest director. But that's that wasn't in the contract that they had to have an American publisher. They were supposed to just publish it. And so they kind of just hurry, hurried you know, and found an American publisher and put it out in 74. Anyway, that's what I was up to. And I was writing screenplays and, and, but I was getting immersed in Wells. The next step was when I met Orson Wells. I'm sure you'll ask about that soon. Yeah. So I was going to ask, I was like, 1974, isn't that right when uh, the other side of the wind was starting like uh, filming and well, it's a, yeah, we got a lot of, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, I got okay. a little ahead of the game. There's a lot of, some of these things happen simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did the decision happen that you moved to Hollywood? Well, I wanted to be a filmmaker, as I said, uh, you know, writer, director. Right. And I thought, you know, back then I, I had a script that I wrote that I wanted to direct in Wisconsin. And I actually drew all the shots naively i thought you had to draw all the shots like hitchcock was reputed to do even though it's sort of a myth and i had the the whole script and it was like 400 pages long but it would have cost about fifty thousand dollars and i just didn't have any money at all so i thought in those days what do you do if you're going to make a film uh you go to new york or you go to la and that's about it and so i got in my car and and uh, moved there I had this friend that he moved with me and i had five hundred dollars i won a prize for the wells book as the best book by a Wisconsin author and they gave me 500 which is sort of sadly ironic because it helped me to leave Wisconsin I don't think, <laughs> I don't think they intended that but it's like, you know, okay, I, thanks bye <laughs> yeah okay, thank you here's the money goodbye but you know I mean maybe that's what should happen but anyway so I got I got to us to uh, LA and I went around and tried to apply for jobs in the film industry and I ran into the usual roadblocks you know like uh, we don't have jobs and you know you're not the son of the cameraman or whatever and and uh, the money didn't go, the money ran out after about two weeks. And I had a contact with a, a newspaper in Riverside, California, which uh, again, I naively thought was like right next to LA. It was like a suburb because on the map, it looks like it's right next to LA, but it's 50 miles away, which is a considerable distance. Yeah. And so I got that job. I, I went to Variety and I thought, cause I was a diligent reader of Variety. And I said to the editor, you know, uh, I mean, I applied for a job and he said, well, you sound like the kind of guy we'd like to hire, but we just don't have a job right now, but keep in touch, you know, he's a good guy, Tom Pryor. And I said, I've been offered this job in Riverside. I'm reluctant to go there. And he said, no, take that job. It's good training for you. And it's close to LA. And so I took the job and it was uh, a good newspaper in a very dull town. And there wasn't much to write about, but it was this serious paper and uh, I found myself driving to LA a lot I would um, after work I'd get in my car and go to LA to screenings and I started having friends there and meeting people and making contacts and uh, I taught a, the first film course I taught was uh, well in 1969 I was invited to go to a university in Pennsylvania St. Joseph's College they invited me to speak on Orson Welles. I was 22, I think, and I didn't, I, I had no idea how to give a lecture and there were like 400 young people there and I was about their age. The guy who invited me, this professor, when I got off the plane, he had a little group of students to greet me and I guess he thought I was gonna be this older guy <laughs> and this kid gets off the plane and he wasn't very nice about it, frankly. He was kind of irritated that this kid gets off the plane, but I, you know, I mean, I, this was my first experience. So I, I somehow rallied myself and I gave a talk on Kane. But um, in, in um, LA, I, there was a wonderful little school called Sherwood Oaks Experimental College that a guy ran who was just a film buff. And he, there's so many great people living in LA and that's true today too. But back then there were all these legendary characters still alive. and. And so he would just call them or go see them and say, would you come and talk to our students? And they were very generous. And so I taught a class called International Film Directors in 1974. And we had our guests were Howard Hawks, Fritz Lang, 
uh, Roman Polanski, Bob Rafelson, and Maximilian Schell. How's that for a lineup of directors? Great. So, some of the most revered directors of their era. Yeah, I mean, two Pantheon directors is Andrew Serres, we call them uh, Hawks and Lang, you know, I mean, two, two of the all time greats. And then Polanski, certainly a great director. And, um, and Shell was an Academy Award winning actor, and he's, he's, he's becoming a director. And Rafelson is an interesting new Hollywood director. He brought the movie Head that Jack Nicholson had written, and we watched that. And so that was really cool. And I got some crash experience in, in uh, teaching. I didn't think of becoming a teacher seriously until I moved to uh, San Francisco in 2000. Although I was offered a job as a teacher by Cal Arts which is a good university around LA, best known for animation, but they offered me a job teaching screenwriting when I was 27. And it was very nice of them, but I thought I'm not ready for this because I'm still trying to establish myself as a screenwriter. I'm not sure I can devote you know, enough serious attention to the students, which you really have to do as a teacher. Right. And I wasn't sure that I was capable of doing this. So I turned it down and, you know, it's one of those things you think if I had done that, my life might have been different, but I don't look back and worry about those things too much. But uh, anyway, so I, I moved to LA full time after a year in Riverside. I just got uh, totally fed up with that. And I called the guy at Variety again, the editor, and I said, hi, uh, anything going on? He said, can you come down right away like this week? Because some guy had just quit. This is how you get jobs in newspapers. Uh, a guy had just quit to become a publicist and um, they hired me right away. And that was a fantastic job. I did that for three years then, and then I came back for more tours of duty later. But I was able to go on sets of films and see films being shot, and I, I could meet anybody in the business pretty much. I could pick up the phone, and Variety is, it's like open stores for you. Today, you can't do that. They, they It's become much more corporate. They don't like reporters prowling around sets and talking to people too much without publicists being a filter. But I, you know, I was on the sets of films because in Wisconsin, I didn't have much real understanding of how films were shot. Uh, I'd seen one film shot, The Immigrants and The New Land, actually, it's two films. The Swedish films were shooting in Wisconsin, and Mike and I went to visit the location and had a wonderful time. We wrote that up for Sight and Sound. But so I went on the sets of many Hollywood films, including Family Plot, the Hitchcock film for three days. And, um, um, oh, uh, I was going to mention a couple of others, but there are some, some really good films and some really routine films, but it was just fascinating to see how they shot films. And then I interviewed, I made a point of interviewing all the directors and writers I admired, and I got to most of them. And they were very generous with their time. Part of it was these older directors were kind of neglected by Hollywood at that point. They were having trouble finding work because the young people were taking over. And so they were happy that somebody cared and, and that somebody knew their work. So I'd go to see Howard Hawks and Frank Capra and people like that. And that developed into relationships where I began thinking of writing about these people. And Hawks, for example, I, I went to see because um, he was a great storyteller and I thought I could learn a lot about screenwriting for him, which I did, even though he wasn't a screenwriter per se, but he, he was helped work with the writers in his films. And he was he was great. So I recorded all the sessions. And after a while, I realized I had enough for a book. So I turned it into a book called Hawks on Hawks. And then Capra, when I met him, it, that spun off. Uh, I mean, it, it enabled me to think about writing a biography of him, which I did later. And so, uh, so this all you know, took place while you were in Hollywood, right? Yeah, this was sort of my film school was yeah. two things being on Variety and working with Orson Welles, which actually began in 1970 and lasted till 76 on the other side of the wind. That, those were the dates. So it happened before I moved to uh, Hollywood. My first, my first visit to Hollywood was August of 1970. I was still a reporter on the newspaper in Madison. I left that part out. I was, <laughs> I was a reporter for three years. Being a reporter is a great, great training for a screenwriter or a, a writer in general, because mm -hmm. you meet all kinds of interesting people and interview them and have to write up all kinds of stuff. And, you know, every day you don't, don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, I wanted to write, I wanted to meet John Ford, who was hard to interview, didn't like to give interviews. And I, I wangled an interview with him. And so I flew out to um, L.A., and I met him, and that afternoon I met Jean Renoir on the same day, 
and then like I called Peter Bogdanovich, who who was kind of unknown at the time, but he was a young journalist who, who was doing what I did. He interviewed directors and stuff, and I admired what he did. And he directed a film called Targets, which I thought was terrific. It didn't make much impact, but I thought this guy's really good. So I called him, and um, he said, I'm on the other line with Orson. Could you hold on a minute? And I thought, oh, my God, Orson. Because <laughs> I thought Wells at that time was always in uh, Europe. He wasn't yeah. accessible, and you never knew where he was, except in Variety that mentioned he was doing this and that. And so Orson, it turned out, was in uh, L.A., and Peter said he would like to talk to you. Call him tomorrow at this number. And I thought, wow. And so I called him. And the first thing he said to me was, we're about to start shooting a film. Would you like to be in it? And I was totally flabbergasted. I had never acted before, unless you count being an altar boy, which is kind of a form of acting. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's different because you have your back to the audience and you, you can't improvise and you don't put emotional inflections on the lines. <laughs> you don't have facial expression anyway uh so uh I, I all i could think of was kind of a stupid question i said is this going to be a feature length film and he laughed <laughs> and he said well we certainly hope so <laughs> but actually that turned out to be kind of an, a good question because over the years it was a real question whether this would ever be a feature length film and that's a whole story in itself but so by the end of the week i was acting in an orson wells film and um peter had recommended me actually um after Peter had been told by Wells to round up some young film buff types for the film. And he met me and he thought I was perfect because I was kind of very earnest and funny and uh, knew a lot about films, but I was kind of gauche. And one thing Peter thought was funny, I had a lot of hand, a lot of writing on my hand when I saw him. He said, what's that? And I said, well, I was at Fellini's Satyricon this afternoon and ran out of paper. So I started taking notes in my hand. He thought that was hilarious. And <laughs> he told me years later, that's one reason I got the part because he told Orson, I met this young guy who writes notes on his hand when he watches movies and Wells thought that was hysterically funny. And so in the film, he, he had me do it for six years. I had to write all over my hands and it, it's kind of, it became kind of a hassle doing this. And um, uh, but in the movie, they actually have two sh shots where I, it's just me writing on my hand in the car. I guess they thought it was funny even uh, many years later when they put the film together. Yeah. <laughs> so by the end of the week, I'm acting for Wells with Bogdanovich. And, and I think behind Andrew there, you can see the picture of me on the first day rehearsing mm -hmm. with Peter on the right and Orson there. And uh, Orson um, had written this, uh, well, I said, do you have a script? And he, he pointed to a box under his table there. He's sitting at a typewriter table. And yeah, <laughs> this is typewriter. They had this big box. He said, I've, I've been, I've written several scripts and many notes and, and I could write a whole novel about this guy, Jake Hannaford, this old director. And, uh, but I'm, uh, he had planned to improvise the movie in a sense. It didn't quite come out that way, but you can see a documentary in 1966 where he talks about this plan to do a new kind of movie where, he said he was going to cast people who were what he called personages who were kind of resembling the characters in the film and uh, let them kind of do their own dialogue and, and see where that went. But he told me, I, I know the character really well, I know the situation, and I, I'll improvise out of all that. So what he did was with me, uh, every day he had me um, talk to him for like an hour before the scene and, and uh, suggest lines that I could say to John Huston's character, the main character. I was supposed to be this young uh, film historian following him around asking sort of goofy film buff questions. And so it's natural for me to propose some and then he would find some funny and some not and then he would change them around to make them a little more pretentious or whatever. And then he'd type it out and hand me a page and I had to do it exactly the way he wrote it at that point. I couldn't improvise and I could not improvise any movements or anything. He would, he would yell at me if I tried to do that. So I felt kind of like a puppet for a while, but then I gradually relaxed into it. We can talk about that later. But. So oh, how intriguing. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, if you had. No, you have... I just, I just, I, I find that fascinating. It's like uh, improvised script writing, but at the same time, there was an end goal that he was like, okay, this is it. Let's do it now. 
Yeah, and you're an actress, so you find that interesting, especially because, mm -hmm. um, you know, actors, when I, I wrote later the American Film Institute Life Achievement Award shows for five years with George Stevens Jr., the producer, and I naively said to him when I got hired for the Jimmy Stewart tribute, I said, how does this work? Do the stars come in with uh, stories to tell or scripts? And he laughed and he said, Joe, these are actors. They need a script. <laughs> and, you know, and so uh, my job was to um, basically recruit people to be on these shows. And I got to work with some of the greatest legends in, in film history because that was the nature of the shows. And people, uh, older actors and young guys would never work with, but I was wonderful. But I would go and talk to so-and-so and I would uh, pump them for stories and discuss things. And then I would take it, go home and craft a speech that sounded like the person. The trick was to make it sound like it came out of the head of the person unfiltered, but it was actually very carefully scripted. And, um, um, you know, they, they, they actors do um, need a script because, you know, you saw in the recent Academy Awards, I always thought that, you know, I love the, the acceptance speeches on the Oscars and I thought I don't like it that they cut them short, but now I can see maybe why they do that because <laughs> they let the uh, people ramble on. It got really um, tedious <laughs> after a while. Yeah. So sometimes actors need some help, but there once in a while an actor would come into our show with a perfect little, uh, speech to give and we wouldn't tamper with it much but sometimes they would say like betty davis didn't like frank capper and vice versa and we said do you have anything to say about him and she said no just write me something and so i thought well i'll use her to tell us why he's a great director you know <clears throat> somebody should do that so i wrote a little speech for her and uh, the producer read it to her on the phone she said perfect and she came in i was really touched because uh, Betty Davis, my God. So she came into the rehearsal, this little tiny lady, which is surprising because on screen she seems formidable. But she said, uh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I made a few little changes in your uh, script. And I said, oh, geez, come on, you're Betty Davis. Uh, I'm sure you, sure you made good changes. But if she had not, uh, we always took the precaution of rehearsing. And if she had made a change that wouldn't work, I would, in a nice way, work with her and come up with a solution. But it worked out beautifully. She personalized it a little bit. And, you know, but but going back to the other side of the wind, um, it turned out, I, I guess I was the only actor he worked with that way. Uh, he wrote the, Peter told me that he had, Wells had written his entire part and he didn't do any of the writing for his part. And then he had a lot of other wonderful actors like Edmund O'Brien, Mercedes McCambridge, Norman Foster is fantastic in the film, Paul Stewart. Um, and he wrote their parts and gave them their lines. Uh, but I think he, you know, like a good director does, good writer director, he, he knew the personalities of these people and so he tailored the roles for them. And then Jean Renoir said once, you should always change the script to fit the actor, not the other way around. And Wells, I think, would do that if an actor had trouble with the line or if he, he or she came up with a little better line. He would, he was very flexible. He would go with whatever seemed good at the time. And if somebody had an idea or, or balked at something, he would improvise a solution. He could he could make up solutions and scenes on, on the moment. Uh, and that was just really great to watch. And so that actually transitions, I think, beautifully to the next question. Um, you have gone on record saying Orson Welles uh, is the greatest American director of actors. Am I correct? I'd say the greatest director of actors in the cinema. Okay. Uh, of course, okay. that takes, you know, that would put him up there with Ingmar, Ingmar Bergman, who's pretty darn good, too. Uh, mm. I mean, actually, you know, when you say somebody's the greatest, it's like in baseball, they call it the GOAT, greatest of all time, you know. How do you compare Ted Williams and Willie Mays and Babe Ruth or whatever? But uh, Wells is right up there anyway. Uh, okay. So what experience did you personally have working with him or what did you witness that proved, oh, he is the greatest? Well... I mean, he liked working with a mixed cast of highly professional actors and non-actors. You know, it's kind of stimulating for him. And he learned that back in the 40s when he went to Brazil to do It's All True. And he worked with uh, mostly unprofessional actors, but some professionals. And I think he liked the mixture of those things and some other directors do too. Um, so the ability to take an, uh, somebody who couldn't act like me and get a performance out of me was kind of amazing. I don't know how I did that. I wasn't sure I was any good, but people thought I was good when the film came out. I would be the last to know. So, you know, I guess I fit the part well. And I learned a, I learned a lot from over the years. And some one of the other 
one of the crew guys said, you're the only person in the film who visibly ages during the film because <laughs> it took five years. And, and I really uh, got, you know, uh, I, I mean, I looked very young when I started and I looked a little more mature by the end. Mm -hmm. But the other people were all kind of older people, mostly, or, or somebody like Susan Strasberg, who was a beautiful, mature actress. And, uh, but I look like I'm changing, which maybe is one reason the acting got a little better. But I got to redub my part, by the way, at the very end of the process. Um, it turned out they had lost a lot of the original sound recordings. They couldn't find them. They, they fortunately had not lost the film footage, but they this had was, to- This was when uh, it was in Netflix. Yeah, Netflix finished the film. They, it's a long story. It took forever. I tried and other, other people tried to finish it. I had the idea of going to a cable channel because all the main film studios turned it down and we weren't getting anywhere. So we, I got uh, Showtime interested and then that fell through. Uh, but Netflix took it over and they were terrific. They, they gave six million dollars and carte blanche to Frank Marshall and Peter Bogdanovich and uh, Philip Jan Remza, the producers who all pooled their talents and, and Netflix didn't interfere and trusted them. And uh, Frank Marshall is a great famous producer who's done a lot of big films and so they, they really relied on him but yeah, at one yeah, point Jones films yeah yeah uh, he worked a lot with Spielberg and and so at one point he had to go back to them and said we just we lost a lot of the sound uh, uh, we can recreate it, some of it from work prints but it took a lot of work on the part of the sound experts one of whom had won the Oscar for Schindler's List for example and uh, to reclaim the sound but w what they tried to do was um, um, I was one of the last surviving cast members, and so they, they said one day when I was down there advising them, because I was a consultant on the film, they said, oh, would you mind going in the other room and uh, re-recording some of your lines <laughs> without any notice? And I said, oh, okay, sure. You know, with with films, you just do whatever they ask you. Um, I'll, I'll digress for a little funny story. Please. I knew Sam Fuller really well, a great director, and one morning at 9 30 morning i was asleep on my couch and the phone rang and it was sam he said sam i said my boy my boy uh he said i have a question for you and i said okay what is it sam and he said can you piss purple and i i thought what the hell is this question i don't know and all i could think of i'm very literal minded i said i don't know i just piss yellow just like everybody else and he said okay goodbye and then i hung hung up and i went back to sleep and three days later i remembered this and i called him and i said what was that about and he said well I was shooting a scene for the Big Red One in the mountains, uh, you know, San Bernardino Mountains to get the snow uh, for the Battle of the Bulge. And I had a scene where a young guy gets shot, a soldier gets shot as he's trying to take a leak in, in the snow and blood comes out. And then he falls over and dies of a heart attack. And uh, that was supposed to be my part, but because I, I didn't, just say, yeah, I could piss purple. I didn't get this part, you know. And I kicked myself around the block that I could have had this little <laughs> bit part in the big red one. So when a director calls you, just say, sure. You know, like the old story is when directors would say to stars, can you ride a horse? They'd always say, sure. And then they'd run off and spend three weeks learning how to ride a horse, you know. But with Wells, um, you know, I mean, I, I just was plunged into this situation. But w what were we <laughs> digressing from? I was going to tell oh, you. Uh uh, what greatest American director, uh, greatest director of actors? Oh, I, yeah, I was going to give you some examples of. Um, well, he was very um, good to the actors. He believed the actors are the most important people in the film because that's who we watch as an audience. We identify through them, and they're the front line. And you know, they have a tough job because their bodies and, and uh, spirits and voices are on the line, and they're harshly judged if people don't like them. Uh, whereas the crew, we don't see them. Wells was tough on the crew he was perfectionistic and demanding, but the crew put up with it because they admired him so much. And they were mostly young guys, like 19, 21 year, year old guys. And there were a couple women on the crew, but he was pretty, pretty rough on the crew. He was, um, you know, he didn't, he, he didn't waste a lot of time flattering them or being nice to them. And sometimes he was unreasonable, but with the actors, he was super nice. And he, he made the set a lot of fun. That's one thing that they miss when they, when Wells appears as a character in films, he's always portrayed as an ogre and unsmiling mean guy. That's not the way he was on the set, except for moments with 
when he told the crew they didn't have time to go to lunch and things like that. <laughs> but with the actress, he was uh, he he was telling funny stories. He was even singing songs from old musicals that he did when he was <laughs> in prep school, and and he was uh, telling jokes. And it was just like a, a performance. It was so much fun. But he was molding our performances in that way and uh, listening to people and. You know, a good director will direct everybody differently to a bad director will direct everybody the same way. And Wells really understood people and psychology and, and how to talk actors language. Robert Town, the screenwriter, says a writer has to know how to talk to stars. And I learned how to do that from working on those AFI shows. You have to communicate with actors. Some some directors just can't communicate with actors very well. And it shows in their work. But Wells really knew what to say. and. The, to me, the best example was uh, there was a scene that isn't totally in the film, it's partly in the film, where John Huston, who plays this old macho director, and the film is a critique of uh, machismo. Wells was asked by one of his colleagues, Orson, what's this movie about? And he said, it's it's a uh, an attack on machoism, is what he called it. And it's it's um, some people misunderstood this because in the Me Too era they think what is this old director sexist uh, racist guy running around Wells was you know critiquing that because a lot of the old directors were like that so Houston is this um, charismatic but kind of difficult guy and he walks into this party that they're holding to celebrate his return to Hollywood. He's trying to make a comeback in the new Hollywood of the Easy Rider era. And Peter Bogdanovich arrives with this young blonde uh, starlet. And the old guy takes the girl away from Peter in this crude sexual power play. And it was kind of Wells's wicked spoof of Sybil Shepherd, who was Peter's girlfriend at the time. And that, that doesn't exist in the film now. And I suspect Peter might have kind of removed that little part. But you see the girl floating around and you don't quite know how she got to the party. But anyway, Houston walked into this party scene with this girl and uh, he had sort of this lecherous look and he was rather crude about it, you know, uh, flaunting her in this crude way. And, and I could tell that this was not right. And I was really wondering how Wells would correct this because Houston was his peer as a director and actor. And he's not about to say, John, you know, you're really being... Uh, overbroad here and crude and in front of a bunch of people, you know. So how's he going to handle this? And so I looked at Wells and Wells kind of paused and thought for a minute. And then he said, John, you know who you remind me of in this scene? And, and uh, Houston said, no, Orson, who? And he said, your father. And Houston beamed because he loved his father, Walter Houston, who was a great actor. And Wells had worked with Walter Houston on the radio. And, and he said, oh, really, Orson? Why? And, um, and Wells said, um, because he had this kindly paternal air, but nobody ever had a higher score. And Houston roared with laughter. He thought this was hilarious that Wells would say this about his father, which must have been true. Uh, and so he played it with this kindly paternal air instead of this lecherous crudity, you know, and he was just wonderful. Uh, but he was still flaunting the girl around, but he was doing it in a more subtle way. And it was just a terrific piece of acting. But what a great piece of direction to give an actor to make him feel comfortable and flatter him and come up with something that was psychologically uh, meaningful, you know. It's like Renoir when um, you see rushes of Jean Renoir directing films. Every time he ended a, a scene, if it wasn't right, he would say, that was wonderful, but, you know, maybe we could try it this way, you know. He, he, and I've, I've worked with directors who do the opposite. They say, cut. And then the actor is like, what, what? And they say, we're going to do it again. And then the poor actor doesn't know what's wrong, you know. Or they'll say, even worse, uh, cut. That wasn't right. Let's do it again, you know. And the actor is humiliated. But Renoir would always say, oh, it was wonderful. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we could do it a little, you know, whatever. It's just kind of, you need to treat actors with kid gloves. And that's what Wells did. But Renoir told me, he said, uh, uh, a director needs to have a, um, uh, an iron hand inside a velvet glove, he said. <laughs> and That's Wells a great had, thing. Yeah, that well said. That I heard that from Renoir the first week I was in Hollywood. By the way, I thought that week, uh, I thought every week in Hollywood would be like that. And I didn't realize this was the pinnacle. It was all downhill from that point on. That was the highlight of my, my Hollywood experience, uh, meeting my three favorite directors in one week 
getting a role in a film directed by Orson Welles and meeting Peter Bogdanovich the same week. <laughs> so, yes, just for those audience, those at home keeping track, Jean Renoir probably generally considered the greatest French director ever. Yeah. Uh, John Ford considered the greatest director of Westerns ever, and Citizen Kane and Peter Bogdanovich all in one week. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, for those all, keeping track. They're all giants of the medium, you know, and Renoir was a great director of actors. When you, I was thinking of him when I thought of Bergman, that Renoir was some of the greatest performances in film were directed by Jean Renoir. Yeah. And he was also, he worked in America and he lived in America for a long time. And Ford did a lot more besides Westerns too. He, um, I mean, one thing I said to him was, um, I referred to him being a director of a lot of Westerns. And he said, I haven't directed as many Westerns as all that, you know. And <laughs> he actually directed 54 Westerns, which is a hell of a lot. But he made 137 films as a director but that means he made about 80 films that weren't Westerns. You know, he did a lot of other kinds of things too, but um, he was very versatile, but he's known for Westerns. He's kind of our poet of the Western saga. So there's a, in my biography on Ford, I start with an epigraph of uh, one of Ford's last, I think it was his last interview was, he gave to some guy, even though he told me ours was his last interview. He gave one more, I think. But he said, uh, you, you say somebody's called me the poet of the Western saga. He said, uh, uh, I don't know what a saga is, and uh, I would say that is horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> but he is the poet of the Western saga, there's no doubt. So if I may go back to the other side of the wind, uh, as we sort of, we're almost nearing the first end of the first hour. Uh, so just to kind of wind down our conversation on the other side of the wind. Um, it took, correct me if I'm wrong, it took over 40 years to complete? Yeah, I'm glad you asked about that, because that is, people are wondering, what's what's up with this film? Uh, you can read about it. There's a book by Josh Karp, The Whole History of the Film. And in my book, Whatever Happened to Orson Welles, about a third of it is the saga of trying to finish The Other Side of the Wind. And then I complete it in the new edition. But um, to make a long story short, Welles started with his own money and Oya Kodar, his companion, and they put their own money into it. And then they started running low on money because it, it was a very ambitious film. So they made a, a, a unfortunate mistake. They, they joined up with the Iranian government was investing in films at the time through a company in Paris. And they put some money into it. And that meant that Wells had to split the, uh, the ownership. And then uh, he kept asking for more money because he needed more. And then every time he asked for more money, they would take away some of his percentage until he got to the point of owning like maybe 20% of his film. And then the Iranian um, revolutionaries overthrew the Shah. And this company was run by the brother-in-law of the Shah. And so the Shah was sending agents around the world looking for the assets of, of the, Shah, the royal family including the other side of the wind. And so they actually went to the office of uh, the Paris producer and they demanded the negative of the film. And the way she handled it was she pulled out some papers on her desk and she said, oh yeah, I just got a, a tax bill on that film. Uh, you can have the film, but you got to pay this big tax bill, you know? <laughs> and the guys kind of looked at it and they said, oh, well, we'll come back later. You know, they never came back. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Wells had to smuggle the film out of Paris, uh, the work print, in a little Volkswagen because uh, he had a dispute with the producer and brought it, brought the work print to America. And then he and the producer feuded for, you know, I don't know, more than a decade about the financial stuff and the legal stuff. And Wells went to France to try to get his rights as the author of the film. France is a more uh, supportive attitude toward uh, directors than we do in America. And uh, he won the lawsuit to have artistic control, but the Iranian producer kept the rights to the material. They had to work out a deal, in other words, before the film could come out, and that was another stumbling block. And then Wells died, and the film was left in limbo. And then, you know, for years, Gary Graver, the cinematographer who was extremely loyal to the film and really the, the key guy to get this film made, he was trying to sell it to various people. and. and he took it to Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, and they all kind of passed on it. And then I, at one point, I was trying to talk to people, can we just finish this film? And um, I, I called Gary in the 90s and I said, let's put our forces together and try to finish this film together. And so we joined forces and we got this deal with Showtime. We got an executive there who wanted to do it. 
And I just pulled a figure out of my hat, $3 million deal. And they said, okay. And uh, I was going to produce it. And Peter Bogdanovich was going to do the post-production. And Oya Kodar and then Peter, and Peter then fired me immediately because they thought they didn't need me anymore. And I thought, well, this is really unfair, but I'm not going to object because I don't want to put another roadblock in this film. So I just said, okay, forget it. I washed my hands of it. You know, I'd spent a long time working on this thing, offering it to various companies, and Frank Marshall had been trying to do that too. So finally, it was resuscitated by this Polish producer, Philip Jan Rimza, and I, I advised him. There was a German guy involved too. It's very complicated. I advised those guys on, on all the problems, and Oya still owned um, Orson's share of the film, and the Iranian family still owned their share of the film. So I had worked out a thing where I said, let's have Oya and the Iranians split split the thing 50-50. And they, the Iranians agreed because they just figured, hey, you know, we're not getting any money out of this. Let's, let's just cash out. But Oya started being difficult. And so Philippe took nine years of negotiations with Oya to get her to agree to uh, sign this uh, deal. I mean, I'm glad, frankly, I'm glad I'm fired because it would have wasted years of my life dealing with Oya is very difficult. And uh, he finally persuaded her to do this. And then they brought Netflix involved. Netflix became a phenomenon, as we know, in recent years. They have a huge uh, pot of money. And Wells, I think, would be thrilled that Netflix exists and, and released his film because he has the biggest audience he ever had, you know, because they're in more than... Uh, what 185 countries and and um, untold millions of people have access to the film and it's running all the time there it's been out for about two years and it's going to keep running and um, so it's just great and the people who finished it uh, Bob Morawski I should mention the editor did a fantastic job of editing the film in the style Wells intended Wells had edited 41 minutes of the Party scenes, which are the framework, and the film within the film by Jay Hannaford, which is seen intermittently in the film. And he made it all work together in the way that Wells intended. And they had to do a lot of work with the sound, et cetera. And they had to shoot some special effects scenes and stuff. But I think it came together really well. I, I, I disagreed with a few little, a few decisions, but Jonathan Rosenbaum and I were advisors on the completion. And so they took our advice sometimes and some advice they didn't take. But anyway, it came together. I think it was really triumphant that this film came out. It should have come out because it's Wells's testament film about his art and his and the industry. And it's it's a very provocative film and, and, and a really experimental, rich film. And it's out there. Ariana, I believe you had a question. Um, no, I was going to ask because you often talked about... Uh how working with Orson in the beginning was kind of like your master class in filmmaking because you were mm -hmm. pretty introductory at that point, but mm -hmm. more self-taught. Like, what was it about being on set with him and the way he did things and, you know, the crew that was there that mm. helped teach you about filmmaking? And what uh, specific points have you actually brought to your own students? Well, one thing I learned, uh, like I told in the story about Houston, is how to handle people. Like, the very first day of shooting... We were doing a scene in a car where I was in the back seat with Peter Bogdanovich asking questions of Houston, who was supposed to be in the front seat, but he hadn't even been cast yet. But we were asking a question anyway. But yeah. uh, Gary Graver stationed himself with his camera out on the sidewalk as we drove by. And, and Peter said to Orson, you know, Orson, he's in the wrong place. He shouldn't be outside the car. He should be inside the car, right? And Wells said, yeah, I know that, Peter. But if I correct him today, it's the first day of shooting. He'll never feel like ask, uh, making a suggestion again. And I thought, what a, what a wonderful piece of psychology, because I was the kind of guy I would have said, hey, Gary, that's the wrong place to stand. And, but, you know, Wells knew that he's going to work with this guy for years and he's going to have to, you know, so he shoots it from the wrong angle. He can shoot it again. And we reshot the scene the year later anyway. Uh, just things like that, how, how a director handles people, and works with people and how how you improvise solutions when things don't work and how you make things work and also how you bring layers and depths to, of complexity to scenes, you know, through little things and big things. And, uh, I, you know, I was on the sets of a lot of big Hollywood films that were very industrial in terms of having 100 people on the crew and Wells had a crew of maybe 
10 or 15 people and it was all more like a home movie and i i think that's a good model for films uh, you know today i preach uh, to my students do guerrilla style filmmaking low budget and well said uh, to henry jaglum the less money you have the more freedom you have because if you have a 200 million dollar budget you know you have all these people telling you you can't do this and you can't do that and you've got to do this and but if you have um no money uh, nobody cares they'll let you do what you want the, the problem then is getting it shown you know but if it's good it'll get shown eventually and so that that's kind of one thing i learned uh, was maverick filmmaking gary graver i learned a lot from him he was he could he could shoot very fast set up very fast and i i, I like that i like that kind of uh, quick-witted style of filmmaking as opposed to you know on the sets of big hollywood films it, sometimes the waiting is interminable as as the dp sets up the lights and i was on the set of the blues brothers once for five hours and nobody showed up i was on the set all by myself i kept waiting for people to show up and nobody showed up and i just went home they were probably all in the trailers doing coke i'm sure is what it was <laughs> uh, but then oh, when you goodness. saw that film it was this big bloated mess you know yeah. what's the point so i guess i learned some intangible things about uh watching how a director should behave and somebody who's a writer director uh how they create a uh, uh, film and, and also how you, uh, Wells kept it all in his head. I was sitting next to the script supervisor when he told her not to talk to, to him anymore. <laughs> so, I don't know I hear from you again, you know, and this poor, poor woman is sitting there. And that caused some problems in post production because you need a record of everything, but it was in his head, you know, and uh, but fortunately they could. Uh, Gary knew all this stuff, and, but then Gary died. And so that they, they relied on me and Peter and other people who were there to say, what was Wells trying to do in this scene? Because there was, uh, and he left some records of it. He left memoranda and stuff, but sometimes you had to kind of guess. And Bob Morawski did a great job of thinking like Orson, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't the usual regimented way to make films but i think it's a better way to make films really although it doesn't hurt to have a script supervisor who <laughs> takes notes that you listen to and right you know, wells well wells had his flaws you could be uh curt with people and uh, you know uh, you know collaboration is such an important part of filmmaking uh I, I did two books of afi seminars i edited those five million words i read into two books they were very interesting to read, but I had to condense them. But Alan Pakula, the very good director said, uh, and I use this as an epigraph to the books. He said, the best thing about movies is that they're a collaborative medium. And the worst thing about movies is that they're a collaborative medium. <laughs> and that's really true. It's you're dealing with a lot of human beings and it's not just one person making a film. And it's, uh, you have to get everybody to kind of realize your vision. Ingmar Bergman said, what makes a great director is having a personal vision. And I think that's true. That does distinguish great directors. But how do you get 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 400 people like John Ford had 400 people on Shine Autumn? How do you get them all to work in service of your personal vision? One way you do it is listen to their suggestions. Like Wells said that some of the best scenes in Citizen Kane were other people's ideas, like the scene in everybody remembers when susan is singing at the opera the camera goes up in the uh flats behind the scenes and it goes up to these two guys and one guy holds his nose one of the technicians and uh that was a suggestion in one of the grips and wells thought hey great and he's you know he said the director gets credit for it anyway why not take suggestions <laughs> from people you know only a bad director would say i don't want to hear you you know whatever you know yeah yeah they're kind of you know directors are kind of the mama and papa bears of films they got to be the ones that make everyone connected and comfortable and part of the same goal yeah it's like so being a general and the fun. general doesn't fight the battle a general is kind of helping make the plans but as napoleon famously said the battle plans fall apart the minute the battle begins you know and that's mm -hmm. what happens in films you have to uh you need a plan but then you need to kind of be able to diverge from it moment by moment when circumstances change and a great general will uh delegate authority to to uh, lieutenants and, and people and uh but keep keep something together so that it's all going toward a goal you know listeners if you have any comments questions or suggestions for future episodes feel free to shoot us an email at independentcreatorstudios at gmail.com. If you like this episode, please write a review and subscribe to us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or YouTube. We'd love to hear your feedback. 
Behind the Flicks was created by myself and Ariana. I edited this episode. My name is Andrew Gentile. This has been an independent creator studios production. Thank you.